Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a discussion of wildfire prevention and response. This session has been organized by the Emergency Committee of the American Institute for Conservation. The Emergency Committee works to produce and distribute educational resources around issues of emergency response, prevention, and salvage for the AIC community. I am Saira Hukki, and I have been a member of the Emergency Committee for the last three years. I received my bachelor's degree from Carleton College and my master's degree in art conservation and art history from New York University. I recently joined the National Archives and Records Administration after spending five years as book and paper conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society. Hey everyone, we're so excited to share this session with you. I'm Leanne Na'awal and I'm also a member of the AIC Emergency Committee. I graduated from the SUNY Buffalo State College Art Conservation Department, and I'm currently the paper conservator at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Library. Saira? Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that those of us who are joining this session from North America are on the homeland of indigenous people who have cherished and stewarded the land since time immemorial. Our current lives are made possible because of the colonial mindset that allowed the seizure of these lands from their indigenous owners and the enslavement of African people to labor on it. I encourage you to learn more about the history of the land and the people who have cared for and worked on it. Our first talk today will be by Marianne Beol and Kateri Dedeau Chamberlain on assessing wildfire risks for heritage institutions in Canada. Marianne holds a master's degree in heritage conservation with a specialization in paintings which she obtained in 2018 from the Institut National du Patrimoine in Paris. She joined the Canadian Conservation Institute in 2019 and became an assistant preventive conservation advisor in 2021. In her current role, she provides preservation advice to a variety of clients, including museums, archives, heritage groups, and cultural centers. Kateri completed a BA and an MA in art history at Université Laval, before graduating from Northumbria University with a degree in conservation of fine arts, specializing in painting conservation in 2014. She has worked for the Centre de Conservation du Quebec, the Glenbow Museum, and Library and Archives Canada. She joined the Parks Canada Agency in 2021 as painting conservator, then moved on to the preventive conservation team. In her current position, she provides a variety of preventive conservation solutions to Parks Canada's National Historic Sites and Storage Facilities. She also contributes to the development of preventive tools and trainings. Take it away, Marianne and Kateri. Hi everyone. In recent years, we have witnessed devastating losses to heritage in Canada as a consequence of wildfires. In 2017, the Kino wildfire affected industrial heritage and the indigenous archaeological sites at Waterton Lakes National Park. Last year, the village of Lytton saw its Chinese History Museum and Lytton Museum and Archives completely destroyed. It is with these destructive events in mind that the Canadian Conservation Institute and Parks Canada decided to work together to better understand these risks and find strategies to reduce or mitigate them. Parks Canada and CCI are distinct agencies within the Government of Canada. Although we serve different audiences, we share the common goal of preserving cultural heritage. CCI's three main areas of activity are to deliver conservation services, disseminate knowledge and advance research to promote the proper care and preservation of cultural heritage. CCI's Preventive Conservation Division advises heritage professionals and organizations across Canada, such as museums, archives and cultural centers. Parks Canada is similar to the National Park Services in the US and manages national historic sites, national parks and marine conservation areas. Parks Canada's preventive conservation team focuses on the preservation of the agency's historical and archaeological collections. Parks has its own fire management division, two fire protection engineers, as well as wildfire firefighter teams. The project we're presenting today started in the context of an ICRAM program called Prevent Mitigating Fire Risk for Heritage. 
It included a week-long course last fall and ongoing follow-up projects. The program gathered teams from around the world. Parks and CCI partnered on a joint team consisting of three preventive conservators, as well as a fire protection engineer from Parks Canada. The case study we chose for our project is the Banff Park Museum, which is under the purview of Parks Canada. The site was chosen as many of the challenges it faces are common to other institutions in Canada, including a combustible structure with heritage value, historical collections, and a location in a wildland urban interface, or WUI. Our presentation will focus on the resources and methodologies we used for the wildfire risk assessment that can be applied to other Canadian organizations. As the site is located more than 3,000 kilometers from our workplace in Ottawa, the assessment was mostly done remotely. We used internal and external reports, photographs, and communications with local staff. In addition, the fire engineer on our team conducted a site visit last March. His visit also included a meeting with the local fire department. We used the ABC risk assessment method developed by CCI and ECROM. The ABC method considers three questions. When will the damage occur? What is the loss of value for each object? And what fraction of the heritage asset will be lost? The heritage value of the Benf Park Museum encompasses both the building and the collection. Relative values were attributed to these two aspects after discussions with local staff. 65% for the building and 35% for the content. We assess two risks associated with wildfires. First, the direct hit and destruction of the museum. And second, the effects of smoke during fire season. While very different, both ranked as high for the site. The museum is located in an area where the return period for wildfires ranges between 1,500 and 5,000 years, equivalent to a 2% chance in 50 years. While return periods are useful, assessing whether the museum would actually be destroyed by a wildfire in the area is more challenging. The nearby Bow River provides a natural fire break, but embers could potentially cross it and reach the building. High ember density, high winds, low humidity, and dry fuel would heighten the probability of ember ignition. It should also be noted that return periods are based on historical data and do not take into consideration the increase in fire spread and duration that will likely result from climate change. We used a simplified method from the National Guide for Wildland Urban Interfaces to assess the hazard and exposure level of the site. The method considers the fuel type in the region and within the ignition zone, which we found in the park's fire management plan. The exposure level for the museum was estimated to be low, even though it is located in an area of moderate hazard. We found this guy is this guide is especially useful for new constructions as it includes recommendations for building materials and assemblies that are suited to, to the exposure level. However, we found it less useful to assess the vulnerability of existing buildings. To assess the exposure of the building itself, we turned to the scorecard developed by FireSmart British Columbia. Designed as a quick assessment tool for homeowners, we found that it could be used by heritage professionals to assess their facility. The tool assigned different scores to different hazard factors, looking at combustible building features, condition, and vegetation within 100 meters from the building. As you can see, the site scored 176 points, far exceeding the extreme threshold of 35. Although this exercise doesn't replace a professional assessment, the score sheet can be used to identify vulnerabilities that contribute to the overall risk, like the cedar shake roof. It also shows less obvious areas for improvement, like the lack of non-combustible clearance between the ground and the siding. Our team requested an assessment of the building by the Bent Fire Department so that we can compare both results. This will allow us to evaluate whether the scorecard is a viable tool that heritage professionals could use with their own institutions. 
We also assess the risk of damage due to the smoke season. Smoke contains fine particles. These pose a risk to collection objects, especially those that have complex surfaces and are difficult to clean. Due to their effect on health, cities are increasingly collecting information about the concentration of fine particles, which we can use to assess the risk to collections. We use publicly available historical data on fine particle concentrations measured by sensors installed in Banff and in the nearby town of Canmore. The annual average concentration for fine particles in Banff last year was around 11 micrograms per cubic meter. We can see that during wildfire season, the concentration of fine particles increased significantly, occasionally reaching 600 micrograms per cubic meter. Since the museum has a passive ventilation system during the summer months and doors are regularly kept open to invite visitors in, we expect indoor and outdoor fine particle concentrations to be similar. Accumulation time was calculated by dividing the concentration to which fine particles become visible after one year by the annual average found in Banff. At this rate, fine particles can be expected to become visible in less than a year on objects if not cleaned. Taxidermy animals that are on open display in hard to reach places are the most at risk. Our next step is to identify viable mitigation strategies for the site. Compromises must be made since smoke season coincides with the operational season. CCI, one of our goals for the next five years is to improve communications around fire risk, to increase awareness and develop, and develop new tools to support the heritage communities. This project has shown that wildfire risk is not sufficiently addressed in our resources at the moment. We will look at adapting the tools we presented today. We will also launch an online GIS map of hazards that will map all Canadian heritage organizations. Centralizing information from many data sets, it will allow professionals to get a quick overview of the risks their institution is exposed to, including wildfires. The map will include data such as a type of land cover, historical fires, and return periods. We aim to release this tool in a year or so. With these, we want to help museums assess and reduce their wildfire risk and encourage them to act as leaders by stimulating neighborhood initiatives. We hope this short presentation gave you a good overview of the different tools that are available to assess wildfire risk in Canada. To see the other projects from Prevent participants, stay tuned for the ECROM conference that will take place in September. Thank you, Kateri and Marianne. Our next speaker is Jared Yax, who will discuss preventive strategies for fire preparedness. Jared graduated from Grand Valley State University, having studied history, archaeology, and the German language. He went through the Heritage Emergency and Response Training Program held by the Smithsonian and FEMA in 2019. He has over 20 years of experience in the museum field and is a third generation firefighter, having worked as a paid on-call firefighter for the past 10 years. Jared is currently the Curator of Collections and Offsite Facility Manager at the Tri-City Historical Museum in Grand Haven, Michigan, and also served as a firefighter, medical first responder, and Lieutenant of Station 3 for the Walker Fire Department in Walker, Michigan. He consults with museums around the country concerning strategic planning and emergency response. Hi, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about fire behavior in your building today. Um, really with the historical institutions, you want to understand how fires are going to interact uh, within your building and within your collection to, to help protect and, and save your institution from any further damage that could possibly happen. So when we talk about things like fire, you want to understand fire growth. With ample fuel and oxygen, fires have the ability to double in size every minute. So that means in the first minute, if you have about a 12 square inch fire, going into the second minute, it'll be two square feet. Third minute, it'll be four square feet. Fourth minute, it will be eight square feet. Fifth minute, you'll have 16 square feet, 32, and then 64 within a, what would be like a seven minute response time. So 
So you see fires can grow very fast. So really kind of understanding the materials and where you're putting putting them for of your collection, putting them together uh, can, can make a big difference in what gets damaged. Uh, also understanding then thermal layering within a fire. Uh, in a room and contents fire, you could have a 1200 degree uh, temperature Fahrenheit in the ceiling, about 600 degrees Fahrenheit at eye level and about 100 degrees at the floor level. So when you're organizing your collection and putting stuff in on shelves, really kind of understanding what your, your combustion temperature of your artifacts might be and where you really want to optimally store that stuff uh, could, could make a big difference. You know, thinking that like cotton co cloth will combust at about 513 degrees Fahrenheit. Paper combusts at around 451 degrees. Celluloid only really takes about 150 degrees for that to start to combust. Leather will burn at about 400 degrees. Lead melts at 620, and aluminum will actually burn at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So where you store those objects could make a big difference. The other thing you want to look at when you're uh, planning out your building or looking at where your collection is stored is just understanding flow paths within the building. Uh, fire has a lot easier time climbing than it does moving downward. Uh, fire will tend to follow ventilation paths. So if you have a ventilation system blowing air around, fire is going to follow that ventilation uh, system looking for fuel sources and oxygen. When you have your collection stored in, in various rooms, compartmentalization actually saves a lot of damage from happening. Uh, drywall, understanding the properties of that drywall in the walls of your structure uh, could make a big, big difference on where you're storing objects. 3 8 inch drywall generally has a one hour fire rating, which means it will survive for one hour of fire impingement upon it before it will start to fail. Half hour drywall will give you 30 minutes. Uh, closing all doors at, and keeping them closed, especially when you're not in those rooms, will also help uh, slow the fire from spreading. Even just a cheap hollow core door will give you an extra 15 minutes of time before that fire will, will burn through and spread. You also want to have a basic understanding of your fire suppression systems. There are a lot of different types of systems out there and just understanding how they work and, and how your uh, what you have within your facility is, is pretty important. Um, understanding if you have a dry pipe system versus a wet pipe system. Those wet pipe, pipe systems will have water in them continuously and when they activate, the water that comes out of them is really gross. It's a black sludge at first because that water has been sitting in there for so long. So it's something you have to consider then is after the fire, you're also going to have to clean up that mess. Uh, understanding if you have a deluge system versus a thermal bulb system. With a deluge system, once one head activates, they will all activate, whereas the thermal bulb will contain the activation to just above where the fire is. Those thermal bulbs within your sprinkler mean something. Uh, an orange color means it will activate at 135 degrees. Red bulbs activate at 155. Yellow activated 175, green activate at 200, blue activate at 286, and purple activate at 360 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have a building that's been repurposed for your storage facilities, you may want to consult with your local fire department to make sure you have the correct frangible bulbs within your sprinkler system. You also want to work with your local fire departments. Make them your ally. Um, understand your department and their response time. Many career departments strive to be on scene within about four to five minutes, depending on your location. If you're uh, within a volunteer department's jurisdiction, they may be they may take a little bit longer with five to ten minutes. So it's really understanding how long is it going to take them to get there and what do you need to put into place in order to, to help save your collection while they're trying to get there. Uh, what do firefighters see when they enter a burning structure? Well, the answer a lot of times is not much. Um, we're trying to find our way through a smoke-filled building, so you really can't see more than a, a couple of inches or a couple of feet in front of your face. Uh, thermal imaging cameras can help us out a lot, but it's a lot of what we're doing is feeling our way around on our hands and knees. Um, if you have easy to follow floor plans, uh, really will help your firefighters in your area uh, battle that blaze. Having laminated maps of your facility to show the incident commander will help them find the fire, uh, locate it within the building, and then be able to fight it. Um, since the firefighters are down low, having markings on your floor 
uh, will really help them kind of navigate the building then. And then just make sure that you you try and plan your collection out as simple as possible. Because I know a lot of our, our collection storage areas could be a virtual maze um, that are hard enough to try and find your way through when you can see everything. But now try to imagine making your way through it when you're blindfolded. So uh, last of all, just training time is incredibly important and valuable. Uh, if you don't know who it is, reach out to the fire department and find out who their training officer is, or, or get to know their fire, get to know the fire chief. Invite them out to your facility to do building walkthroughs and training events. So that way, the firefighters that would be uh, assisting you would know the layout of the building and understand what you have, and and you know that way they they know what the importance is of saving all this history. So. Uh, thank you for your time and hopefully a couple of those fire tips will, will help you with your planning and, and understanding of, of how fire works and, and coming up with a, a system to assist the fire department and make sure your collection is as safe as possible. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. Our next speakers are Vicki Lee and Cindy Pierce, who will discuss dealing with fire damage documents. Vicki has worked as a book conservator for over 30 years. For the past six years, she has worked as a conservator at the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA. In 2021, she became a supervisory conservator at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, which is a branch of NARA. Vicky is also an active member of the National Heritage Responders. Cindy has worked for the National Archives and Records Administration at St. Louis in the Preservation Department for 20 years. She started as an intern while completing her undergraduate degree in historic preservation from Southeast Missouri State University. She is currently serving as a member of the National Safety and Health Committee for the National Archives and Records Administration. Hello. We would like to acknowledge that the National Archives at St. Louis and the National Personnel Records Center are located in Spanish Lake, Missouri which is situated on the ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, the predominant indigenous peoples of the area. I'm Vicki Lee, and I'm here with my colleague, Cindy Pierce, to talk with you about recovery methods we've used on burned material from our 1973 fire. Cindy has been working with these materials longer than I have, and will be doing the bulk of the presenting. Here's Cindy. Thanks, Vicki. I'm going to share my screen. The 1973 Military Personnel Record Center fire destroyed an estimated 19 million military personnel records and left 6 million records damaged by fire, water, and mold. Over the last 49 years, the response and recovery of these records have changed and evolved. The first phase was an initial response directly following the fire. It took weeks to remove all the records from the building due to safety concerns. Mold growth was a major problem in the hot, humid Missouri summer. Thymol was sprayed on the records to kill and retard mold growth in an Apollo era vacuum drying chamber at McDonnell Douglas Corporation in St. Louis was used to dry almost 90,000 cubic feet of records. What were the long term effects of these treatments? We will never really know. No documentation was kept of which records were treated. The second phase started when the status of the records changed from temporary to permanent in the 1990s. To facilitate the care of these records in perpetuity, a preservation department was established in St. Louis to provide safe access to the records and the information contained in them. Balancing the access with long-term preservation of the records has been an ongoing challenge. Since the department was established, the mission has not changed but some of the tools and techniques have. Today, I will discuss four areas and how they have evolved. Surface cleaning to remove ash and mold, humidification to flatten distorted pages, mending to attach separated pieces, as well as the reproduction and digital recovery of charred areas. The initial method used for surface cleaning was a nail fist vacuum with a HEPA filter with a piece of window screen placed over the document. Many people still use and recommend this method today, 
but we had several problems with it. First, the screen blocked the brush from making contact with the paper and it left mold. Second, it caused damage to charred parts of the documents, so the Shuko vacuums were introduced. They are medical devices used to aspirate patients, but are also excellent for removing mold from paper. They use a water reservoir to trap mold, dust, and debris so it does not go back into the air. The work, they work very well when adapted with a small vacuum brush at removing surface debris and mold from the paper without damaging it. There is no need for a screen due to their very light and adjustable suction power. Over time, these, however, have been abandoned for the simple vulcanized rubber soot sponge. The sponges would cut, when cut down to about two inches square are the most efficient and effective way to remove surface debris, including mold and ash from stable paper. The smaller the sponge, the less friction, enabling a very delicate cleaning of charred areas. There is no setup or cleaning after use, making it less of a hassle than the vacuums, and the majority of the mold spores are trapped in the sponge and not released into the air. When the sponges get dirty, they can be trimmed down to expose a new surface or thrown away. This is supplemented with an array of cheap paint brushes for, from super soft to stiff. Many records are distorted due to water exposure and mishandling when wet. Over the years, we have tried different methods of humidification and flattening. We have used tray chambers, baker's racks covered in plastic, direct application of moist blotters, and the dome of a suction table. The goal for us is fast and effective. The baker's racks did not work. It was too hard to get an even exposure to all the documents at one time. For years, we used six large trays at a time. It took about four hours for each batch to absorb enough moisture to flatten. It took time to set up and clean up when you were done. With the permission of our lead and conservator, an intern and I developed a process using our dome. With a humidifier and a small fan, we can humidify about a batch in about 15 minutes. The documents are then sandwiched between blotters and put in a book press overnight. I still want to experiment with faster drying times, but I do not want to sacrifice the excellent results we get with the press. Over time, we have made our process more efficient to deliver the needed information to the requester more quickly. We are using SNAP scanners in the decontamination lab to capture the information. Cleaning is only done if the text is covered by ash or mold, and humidification is done only if needed to get a scan. We are using a paint plant mister as a at the cleaning bench just to get the paper flat enough to scan. It is working, but it does not flatten the documents as well as our dome and press method. We use a lot of polyester sleeves. To stabilize fragile and torn documents, it is fast and effective, but does require users to handle the documents with care so that the separated pieces don't fall out and get lost. We have used different methods over the years to attach loose pieces. We started with remoistable tissue bridge bins, but these did not hold well. We then went to Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste. This works very well, but is time consuming to make and the methods the men's have to dry. Several years ago, the main conservation lab for the National Archives, in conjunction with the Library of Congress, developed its own heat set tissue. We were able to adapt that as our primary practice, saving us a lot of time. Several years ago, our digital lab developed a process of digitally enhancing images that have charred portions that are unable to be read or photocopied. The image is captured using an infrared lens. Then a technician adjusts the image in grayscale to allow the ink to stand out and be read. This is extremely helpful in extracting information, but also a very time consuming. We are currently working on ways to speed up and simplify the process as these records typically need to be cleaned before going under the camera. In the 20 years that I have worked with burn records, I have seen both low and high tech methods used to safeguard and provide access to our holdings. Some of the best tools out there are sponges and Teflon lifters. 
With that said, I am excited to see the development of image recognition software that can be used to ma match pieces of fragmented pages together. I would love to hear any ideas that you have for speeding up any of our processes. My last image is an example of something we find in the middle of records and a bit of a riddle. We have not been able to determine what it is. Here's what we know. It follows water paths and it is sometimes in the middle but not on the outside of a file. They come in varying sizes and when analyzed under an electron microscope, they appear to be organic and carbon based. It embeds itself in paper leaving holes. If you have seen this in your collection or know what this is, please let me know. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Vicki and Cindy. Next up, we have Laura Buchner speaking about lessons learned after the fire at the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine. Laura received her Master of Science in Historic Preservation from Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. She is a Senior Conservator and Project Manager at Building Conservation Associates, Inc., where she has been involved with conservation efforts at numerous projects, including the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine, St. Patrick's Cathedral, the New York Hall of Science, and Grand Central Terminal. Hi, so today I wanted to discuss uh, one aspect of fire response that you might not necessarily think about when planning for such a potential disaster, or even when you're faced in the aftermath of a fire and with the need to clean your site and the eagerness to get it open, but it could prove helpful. And that's gathering evidence for a potential insurance claim for cleaning fire soil. Uh, and I wanted to share some basic tips to consider based on lessons learned by Building Conservation Associates um, as we assisted our client, the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine, following two separate fires. So the first fire I want to talk about occurred in December 2001. Um, I wasn't directly involved in this analysis, but it really informs the next fire that I'm going to be discussing. So in 2001, there was this large fire in the north transept of the cathedral highlighted in red. The roof of the structure in this area is wood with a bitumen coating. That ignited as part of the fire. It broke through the wall of the cross and it filled the entire cathedral with smoke. The red line you see on the plan indicates about where this photo in the lower left corner was taken. After it was safe to enter the transept, BCA went into that area and collected materials that had burned parts of the roof. We also collected materials that had soiling on them but would have been cleaned prior to the fire. This was a gift shop, so things like ornaments, that sort of thing that would have been for sale. And then we collected samples of soiling from throughout the cathedral in order to uh, confirm that you know, the soiling that was on the far west elevation was the same as the far east chapel, the same as those materials in the north transept. So we did an SEM EDS um, in order to characterize the soiling on materials, but then we also did a visual analysis of the samples and we were able to identify such wood particles and bitumen particles that really showed the same soiling throughout. And that was sufficient to move forward with the restoration at that time. It was fairly straightforward analysis in comparison to what I'm about to describe from 2019. So in April of 2019, another fire occurred in the cathedral, this time much smaller. And in the crypt level below the, the main portion of the cathedral, below this chapel at the far east end referred to as St. Savior. The image you see on the left of the screen was taken about looking at where this red line is looking east towards that chapel. And you can see the smoke that filled the cathedral as part of the fire. Although it was in a lower level, it worked its way up through the ventilation system. Now, once again, after it was deemed safe for us to go into this area, um, which was close to about a month after the fire, um, BCA was allowed in. We took samples of red representative materials that had burned, which included things like upholstered and wooden furniture, painted canvases, cardboard boxes, bubble wrap, plastic sheets, that sort of thing. The walls of this area are granite. The ceiling is a tile, tile fireproof construction. So the structure was fine. It was just these materials that had been stored that had ignited. We also then took samples on materials within the cathedral. However, after the fire, um, indoor air quality and combustion byproduct sampling had been performed by others. Um, and that really is what was sufficient for them to move forward with cleaning the masonry and stained glass. And that was largely done from boom lifts, um, using dry soot sponges and treated dust cloths. Um, you see here on the right of the screen that cleaning being done from boom lifts. On the left is just to give you a sense of the expanse of the cathedral. Again, looking east towards where that chapel would be at the far end. 
Now that claim proceeded really without issue. The problem came when negotiations came up about restoring the great organ. The great organ is um, located in the choir area. Boxes highlighted in blue show the location. So it's essentially between where the fire is and where that early photograph I showed you was. The organ consists of 8,514 pipes. It's a very large instrument. It's very delicate. A large scaffold is required just to get access to it and remove it, um, plus the cost of the actual restoration. So the entire cost of that endeavor of cleaning the fire soiling Essentially, the insurance company said we need hard evidence that there is, in fact, soot on that in order to move forward with this negotiation. Um, BCA had taken samples, as I said, uh, similar to what we did in 2001. However, the visual analysis and SEM proved inconclusive. Um, this fire was much smaller. The particulates were much smaller in this area. We couldn't definitively say, yes, there is soot on this material. Simultaneously, the insurance company hired a conservator who took samples using a vacuum system and sent it out for TEM. This shows you an area where it was vacuumed. Again, this is that choir area looking towards those organs on one side. Those samples came back with TEM and said there's absolutely no soot on this material. Um, it didn't really make sense to us. I mean, this is between where the fire was and that photo taken. And so we decided just to pursue it a little further. We contacted a lab who had a substantial experience with fire soot analysis um, and talked to them. And they reviewed this and said TEM is, in fact, the absolute gold standard. However, they didn't recommend taking samples with a vacuum system. They recommended taking samples in accordance with ASTM D6602-13. Um, and the reason they use this is because a vacuum essentially won't pick up those tacky particles of the soot that want to stick to the surface. Um, so discussions more with the insurance company and their conservator and whatnot, it was agreed one more round of testing. And samples were taken with three methods. Um, there was a tape lift test that was done. This was uh, stuck to the surface and peeled off. And that was in case they needed to do microscopic visual analysis. There were these carbon tape um, on tabs that were taken in case they needed to do another round of SEM EDX. But the main testing was going to be done using polyester wipe samples, um, which were run across the surface of the materials being tested. And then um, that was what was subjected to the TEM. And using this method, instead of the vacuum system, four out of the five samples taken from the organ came back showing that there was, in fact, soot on those materials. In addition, we sent them the materials that we had taken that were removed close to the fire that were expected to be cleaned beforehand. And they sampled those and ran them and compared the soiling on both. And that also exhibited similar soot. Um, this evidence together was sufficient then for the negotiations to move forward for the restoration of the organ to move forward. Um, and here you see the scaffold that was currently installed uh, at the cathedral for that purpose. So. Uh, Taking all this into account, I just want to note that, you know, if you're going to be uh, embarking on a large conservation project um, in which you're going to be cleaning the fire soiling from your structure, before you're initiating that for full cleanup, it's worth the effort of stopping to methodically document exactly what burned, collecting those represented samples, keeping those in storage, collecting samples and materials that you expected that would be clean but now have that so to keep those off to the side and engaging conservator or laboratory that can take samples of the surfaces to be cleaned using those ASTM standards. Just having those in storage is a great idea. You may not need to test them, but should you need to demonstrate was in fact fire soiling versus general atmospheric soiling, being aware that there is a process in which you can do that. I hope this is helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Next, to introduce us to a new resource to help with preparedness for all types of emergencies, including fires, are Sonia Barron and Kim Hoffman of the AIC Emergency Committee. Sonia is a book and paper conservator at NARA and is a graduate of the University of Texas program in library and archives conservation. She formerly worked at the Iowa State University Library, the Huntington Library and Art Museum, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the Arizona State Museum. Kim received her MS in Library and Information Science and her MA in Museum Studies in 2019 from Syracuse University in New York, where she also earned a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Cultural Heritage Preservation. She is the current Vice Chair and Chair-Elect of the Preservation set Section of the Society of American Archivists, or SAA. Hello, my name is Sonia. Kim and I are members of the AIC Emergency Committee. 
This past year, we have been working on updating the Emergency Preparedness and Response Wiki page hosted by AIC. Although this panel relates specifically to wildfires, we believe that the wiki is an appropriate resource for any and all collections emergencies. As many of you know, big and small collections emergencies happen often and they never happen at a good time. Getting prepared for an eventual emergency by having a plan and a team to implement it is incredibly important. Whether it's a water leak or a fire, a step-by-step -step course of action to follow can be your best asset. It's hard to know for sure where to find trusted information. There are so many resources out there and they're often scattered across multiple websites. We want to share with you a resource hub that is free to access. It contains trusted, vetted, and current information on all aspects of emergency preparedness and response. So, how did this project start? Top professionals in the fields of collections care and industrial hygiene took a whole year to compile the resources and then another nine months to review and vet the information. These resources are both in-depth and broad. They're accessible from one web page, which you can see up on the screen. The process was initiated by the working group called REACH. It stands for Resources for Emergencies Affecting Cultural Heritage. The kickoff meeting for the project happened in January of 2020, just before the start of the pandemic. The goals of REACH were to gather resources, verify their quality, and share them out. Many REACH working group members are from different units within the Smithsonian Institution. Others join from outside institutions and organizations. All in all, 29 very busy people participated. These logos represent just a few of the workplaces that the group members hail from. The Library of Congress, FEMA, the Conservation Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania State Archives, the National Park Service, New York Public Library, AIC and FAIC, the National Archives, NEH, Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists, American Industrial Hygienist Association, and more. Early on, one member of the group said that such a project can only be accomplished through micro-volunteerism. A lot of people doing just a little bit of work each equals bringing to fruition a big project, making a big contribution and a strong impact. The structure of the resource library is based around the disaster cycle. It is important to know that this tool is more suitable for proactive planning efforts. It's not as helpful for those in the midst of an emergency. The online resource library is hosted on Zotero. As described on their website, in their own words, Zotero is a free, easy to use tool to help you collect, organize, cite, and share research. This is what the interface looks like. After the REACH group created a one-stop shop for reliable, relevant, and applicable materials, it was integrated into the AIC Emergency Committee Wiki page. We are so happy to be able to share it with you through this presentation. Please tell your friends and colleagues about this new tool. AIC's Emergency Committee is responsible for managing the Wiki page. As time goes on, some links will need to be updated. Emergency Committee members will update the Wiki page and the Zotero library as needed. There's a place on the Wiki page where users can submit suggestions to the committee via email. And now I'm going to pass the baton to Kim who is going to show you how to use the wiki. Thank you, Sonia. Now I'd like to take you all through a demonstration of our wiki page in our Zotero library so that you're familiar with it when you go to check it out for yourself. I'm starting here on the AIC wiki main page and I'll go up to the search bar and search for emergency preparedness and response. And that takes you to our page here. So this is probably a familiar layout to many of you. It starts with this table of contents. Each of these sections has a little bit of additional information and then a link out to the corresponding section of the Zotero library. The page also has a bit of information about our committee, 
context for how this page was developed and some information about the reach group that Sonia discussed earlier. At the end of the page, there's a list of contributors and information about how you can reach out with suggestions or comments in case you find something that you'd like to point out to us or a new resource that you think we should include. So I'm going to scroll down to this section, Resource Library and Zotero, and then to All Inclusive Resources here, just to get us to the top level of the library. This symbol indicates that the link will leave this page. So it's opened up a new page in Zotero. And I wanna point out that there's no account required in Zotero to view and use this content. It's publicly available for all. Zotero does have a login feature if you have your own account and would like to get into advanced settings, but I won't really talk about that here. So looking at the layout, we have a table of contents here on the left that is very similar to the wiki layout that we already looked at. And you can open these sections to drill down and see what content is included in each area. Below that pane is a tag cloud. So if you want to, you can click on one of these tags to show you only the content that includes that tag. I'm gonna click back up here to health and safety. And this shows us the list of items in the health and safety section. So we'll choose one and click on it. And then on the left here is more information about that item. So this info pane changes a little bit depending on the type of resource, but it has things like the item type, the title, the date, and a URL. There's also an abstract in many cases, and that is taken either from the resource itself or is written by a REACH member. I want to particularly point out the notes tab as well. Oftentimes there's really great context that a REACH member has added here so that you can get a better sense for the resource without having to read the whole thing for yourself. This shows the tags associated with that resource. This item has an attachment. It looks like it's the PDF. Some will and some won't. And finally, the related tab. This item doesn't have anything in this tab, but if it had connected resources, say for example, multiple chapters of a book, they should be noted here in this tab to make it easier to navigate between them. So that's the basics on Zotero. We hope you enjoy using this resource and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or comments. We'd love to hear about your experience. Thanks. We would like to thank AIC, the REACH team, American Indust Industrial Hygienists Association, uh, National Collections Program, Sam Snell for bringing people together, and all of you for giving us your time uh, for this presentation. Uh, please note the QR code on the slide. It will take you straight to the AIC Emergency Committee Wiki. Thank you, Sonia and Kim. The Wiki sounds like a great resource. Next, we have Josiah Wagner, who will discuss preparing for wildfires. Josiah grew up in Colorado and began fighting forest fires with the U.S. Forest Service in 1997. He fought fire all over the western U.S. for 10 summers, culminating in four summers working with the Craig Hotshots Elite BLM firefighting crew. He left the fire service for conservation grad school at Buffalo State College in 2006. Since graduating in 2009, he has worked at a number of museums, archaeological digs, and private conservation practices, and has had his own private practice as an objects conservator in Carlisle, Pennsylvania for the past three years. He began fighting fire again with a municipal volunteer fire department nine years ago, and has been working occasionally as a call when needed forest firefighter for the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources for the past five years. 
Good afternoon. My name is Josiah Wagoner. I'm an objects conservator with a private practice in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I've also been a firefighter, both structural and wildland fire, for nearly 20 years. I'm presenting today on the subject of protecting museums from wildfire. This talk is geared toward people who manage museums and libraries, historic structures and other historic resources, and outdoor art collections. I'll be covering the type of threats posed by wildfire, how to protect your museum from those threats, and I'll end with some helpful resources for more information. So, where are buildings subject to threat from wildfires? In general, areas of hotter, drier climate are more likely to experience wildfires and more likely to see big, fast-moving wildfires. In the U.S., that means that we think of the western parts of the country as being the area of major wildfire risk. However, wildfires can and do occur in almost all types of forest, brushlands, and grasslands, and large, destructive wildfires do happen in all parts of this country from time to time. For example, in 2016, the town of Gatlinburg, Tennessee, was decimated by a fast-developing wildfire in the Smoky Mountains. In short, if your museum is located anywhere in near proximity to areas of forest, brushland, or grassland, then there is potential to be affected by a wildfire. This map comes from a website called wildfirerisk.org, created by the United States Forest Service, uh, along with various other partners. It gives a reasonably good idea of the level of wildfire threat to homes in most any community in the United States. It won't necessarily give you threat info for a specific building, but it can be very useful in getting an idea of the general risk in your area. Your local fire chief or forest fire warden may also be able to give you a better idea of just how much wildfire risk there is in your area or even for your specific property. If you manage a ghost town in the high country desert or an historic cabin out in the deep woods, then wildfire is an obvious and major risk. If your museum is on the edge of a town backed up to brush-covered mountainsides, then wildfire is also a very real risk. You may feel a sense of security having the resources of a city at your back, but you should absolutely look into wildfire mitigation measures to give your museum its best chance of surviving a fire. And because a wildfire can also sweep through densely built neighborhoods, the risk is still there even if your museum is a few blocks into town from the open mountainside. On the other hand, if your museum is in the middle of a metropolitan area, then this is one place where wildfire is probably not a major concern. A cautionary case to keep in mind, the nice suburban town of Superior, Colorado is a place where people are generally aware of wildfires, but living in suburban neighborhoods tend not to feel that they are actually at risk. And this is the Superior Town Historical Museum, located in a small park in the middle of town. This is that same nice suburban neighborhood after a wind-driven grass fire last December, reminding us that wildfire can be a threat almost anywhere and at almost any time. And this, unfortunately, is the Superior Town Museum, a picture taken a couple days after the fire. So if your museum is located in any of these areas subject to wildfire, especially in a particularly fire-prone area, how do you protect it? The best protective steps are those that are done long before a fire starts, because really good protective measures take time and planning. And, of course, the safety of your museum staff calls for an evacuation if fire is approaching. The top priority when it comes to wildfire mitigation is to keep fire away from and out of the building. This seems like kind of a no-brainer. We all work in museums. Obviously, we all want to keep fire out of our buildings. But there's a particular reason why I bring this up in relation to wildland fire. Wildfires can be very large, and they may grow very quickly. A large and fast-moving wildfire may threaten hundreds of houses, businesses, schools, hospitals, and museums all at once. A situation like that will drastically stress or completely overwhelm the available firefighting resources. When dozens or hundreds of houses are threatened and there aren't enough firefighting resources for the situation, if fire gets into a building or gets well established on the exterior of the building, there isn't really very much that we can do to save that building. So firefighters are likely to triage that building as unsavable and move on to other buildings that they can protect. That is why it is so important that you take steps in advance that will keep fire away from your building. That's also why in uh, wildfire situations, typically buildings will either survive through the fire with only superficial exterior damage, or they will be completely burned to the ground with not really a whole lot of middle ground between those possibilities. So how does wildfire impact a building? We often think of a wildfire as being a flame front like this. However, the main threat to buildings in a wildfire situation is usually embers, all those little firefly sparks that you see coming off of the fire. 
Embers are easily picked up by the wind and commonly travel hundreds of feet or even hundreds of yards with enough heat to ignite flammable materials wherever they land. Those flammable materials commonly include debris on roofs and in gutters. To mitigate this, keep your roofs and gutters cleaned on a regular basis. And you can also install perforated metal gutter covers to keep debris from building up. Embers can easily catch in cedar shake shingle roofs. In fact, these are so flammable that they have been banned on new construction in many western states. If you are the manager of an historic building with a wood shingle roof, especially if you are located in a particularly fire-prone area, I would strongly suggest that you should consider replacing your nice, authentic wood shingle roof with a more fire-resistant alternative. Asphalt shingle roofs are much more fire-resistant and especially ember-resistant than wood shingles, but they can still burn, especially when they are old, weathered, or damaged. Gaps form which may catch embers, and radiant heat may cause these shingles to curl and the asphalt to volatilize somewhat. And of course, they also don't look very historically authentic. Metal roofs, whether it's standing seam, corrugated iron, or other metal, are considered to be the gold standard for wildfire resistance. But there are a number of other good options available in the form of polyurethane or fiber cement shingles, which are also very fire resistant and give a reasonably good appearance of wood shingles for a historic building. Some of them are even designed to look like historic weathered wood shingles. It may not be quite as authentic as an actual wood shingle roof, but it's a lot better than a smoking foundation. Embers also easily catch in debris underneath decks, including things like furniture that may be stored under there. Also firewood piles, open trash cans, and dry clump grass and landscaping. Tan bark mulch is a great big ember trap. It doesn't flame all that much, but it will smolder forever and it can set fire to flammable plants in the landscaping. Most of the plants in this picture are actually reasonably fire resistant, but any plant may catch fire under the right conditions. There are landscaping companies that specialize in fire safe landscaping and can recommend the least flammable types of plants for your landscaping. If you are in a fire prone area, you may want to use something like pea gravel instead of mulch. It doesn't serve quite the same purpose in landscaping terms, but it is an excellent fire barrier. Embers may also enter into your building through open windows or doors, or through crawl space or attic vents. To mitigate this risk, cover openings with metal screen with a mesh size of 1 8 inch or smaller. There is a mesh over the crawl space vent in this photo, but it's far too large to keep embers out. It may seem counterintuitive that embers would fall up into a soffit vent, however in strong wind eddy currents form under overhangs which can throw embers up into open vents. The screen shown in the bottom left is specifically designed to keep embers out of soffit vents. And ventilation intakes. Large commercial sized ventilation systems usually are screened against outside material including embers, but smaller residential sized ventilation systems may or may not be screened on their intakes. After the embers, the flame front is the next threat. The threat of a flame front is both direct flame contact and extreme amounts of radiant heat. The farther the flames can be kept from your building, the better. Anything that may bring flames closer to your building is a hazard to be mitigated. This includes trees, bushes, and dry grasses too close to the building, and wooden fences, decks, and stairs attached to a building, or flammable vehicles located close to a building. Propane tanks ideally should be located farther away from buildings. However, it is fairly common to see smaller tanks, such as this, right up against the walls. You should never have plants, wooden fences, or other flammable material around a propane tank. When a propane tank is subjected to radiant heat, it will overpressurize, causing the pressure relief valve to open. This will result in about a 15-foot-long blowtorch flame coming off of the pressure relief valve. If it is installed correctly, then that valve should point away from any buildings. If the tank is subjected to too much heat for the pressure relief valve to deal with, then it will explode with poor results for nearby buildings. Vinyl siding. The people that sell vinyl siding will tell you that it is non-flammable, and that may be technically true under laboratory conditions. The problem is that vinyl siding will melt when subjected to radiant heat. Vinyl siding is a terrible, terrible material in fires. Um, you should absolutely avoid having vinyl siding on a museum, if at all possible. Last but not least, there is evidence that lightweight lacy curtains such as this may spontaneously combust just from the tremendous radiant heat passing through a window from a flame front outside. 
So how do we mitigate these risks? Our best tool is defensible space. Create buffer zones between your buildings and the forest or brushlands. The basic idea of buffer zones is creating rings of reduced fuel around your building. Different agencies have slightly different recommendations about the best standards for buffer zones, but generally speaking, it means an inner zone of about 30 feet surrounding a building in which trees are removed and bushes are spread out, and then an outer zone of an additional 70 to 100 feet in which trees are spread out, lower branches are trimmed up, and dead vegetation is removed. This helps to keep fire out of the trees and on the ground in the outer zone, and to slow it and reduce its intensity in the inner zone. If fire can be kept on the ground, it is much easier to control and will throw less radiant heat at buildings. CAL FIRE's website readyforwildfire.org and the NFPA's FireWise webpage both have some good advice on buffer zones. I realize that both the aesthetics and the shade of having trees around buildings is worthwhile, but from a wildfire perspective, trees mean fuel. Conifer trees tend to be highly flammable, and deciduous trees will drop a lot of leaves and sticks onto roofs and gutters. Property owners have to make their own decisions about how to balance those factors. Defensible space can also include pre-made fire breaks. The historic mining town that I mentioned earlier has a four to six foot wide gravel path around much of the perimeter of their site. It is relatively unobtrusive in the landscape and serves as a pleasant walking path for visitors, but it also can be used as a fire break to help firefighters defend the property in the event of a wildfire. Keep landscaping green and well watered. Water conservation is important, especially in times of drought, but in the event of a fire, dry grass is fuel, while green, well watered grass is actually a reasonably good fire break. If you have a sprinkler system in your landscaping, even if it is a misting sprinkler system, it can be activated if a fire is approaching. Enclose areas under decks and stairs to keep leaves and debris out. Keep vehicles and flammable materials such as trash cans, lawn furniture, and those big advertising banners that are so popular for advertising our current and upcoming exhibits away from buildings. Pre-treat lightweight curtains with flame retardant chemicals, or if there's time, remove them. Again, if there's time, then cover windows and doors with treated plywood or metal sheets. In some cases, house wrap may be an option to consider. This historic cabin up in Glacier National Park has been protected with house wrap. It is a laminate material of fiberglass cloth and aluminum foil. It is very effective at turning away radiant heat and embers. It may be used to wrap an entire building, as in this example, or it may be stapled over doors, windows, and other openings. The problem with house wrap is that it is quite expensive, and most importantly, it takes quite a bit of time to apply it effectively. To go back to my earlier point, the best fire mitigation measures are those that are done long before a fire occurs. Last minute steps like house wrap or portable pumps and sprinkler systems, also seen in this example, are helpful, but when a fire is actually approaching, your top priority has to be the safety of your people over that of the building. The Getty Museum, which we all saw recently at the AIC convention, is a great example of what can be done if you have a virtually unlimited budget. The buildings are made entirely of fire-resistant materials. The landscaping was chosen for fire-resistant qualities. It has a filtered positive pressure ventilation system that will keep smoke as well as embers out of the buildings. It has backup generators and, most importantly, a million-gallon water tank, high-volume pumps, and a system of over a thousand sprinkler heads distributed all over the slopes of the mountain so that with the flip of a switch they can soak down everything for hundreds of yards around the museum. The Old Faithful Lodge in Yellowstone National Park has installed a somewhat similar system of sprinklers all over the roof of their buildings so that with the flip of a switch they can soak down the whole building complex. The Getty is basically the gold standard in wildfire protection, but I have tried to focus most of my talk on steps that can be done with a much more modest fire protection budget. In conclusion, here are a number of websites that you can go to for more information on wildfire protection. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you find the information that I've presented today to be useful. Thank you, Josiah. Our last speaker is Camila Corvilla, who will discuss insurance considerations for contemporary art. Camila is an accredited German art conservator for paintings and sculpture in Los Angeles. Her studio, LA Art Labs, specializes in the treatment of modern and contemporary art. 
Camilla completed her graduate studies in paintings and sculpture conservation at the Staatliche Akademie der Bildenden Kunste in Stuttgart, Germany, and has held positions at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for LACMA, the Balboa Art Conservation Center, the National Gallery of Denmark, and the German government. It is my pleasure to welcome you to my talk concerning a case study, a very particular contemporary art insurance claim that we have worked on for two years at LA Art Labs um, in conjunction with, of course, the collector, the insurance, the adjusters, appraisers, the artist, predominantly the artist. So to show you the level of devastation, a couple of pictures. Um, in the top left, you see a total loss. Um, that was declared right away, a total loss. In the bottom left, you see a sculpture that uh, we actually, if you want so, repaired. I will go into detail about this a little later, but it was basically picked up by the first responders during the fire that happened and devastated this building and thrown into the middle of the room. On the right side, you can see a couple of paintings, all of which actually remained in near, nearly perfect condition. So I want to first touch up on basically general emergency response as we do it on site. And we always have like an underlying structure and then work out um, a flow in order to address everything in a timely manner as oftentimes with these type of insurance claims, time is a key factor. So collection management. Here we already worked with a collection management company called Cura Art together who provided this wonderful spreadsheet and also very item specific information. So I have overseen the physical well-being of this part of the client's collection for two years. And I was very familiar with all the surfaces, but having this type of account and spread spreadsheet is really invaluable because you can really add so much information about condition changes and then also first treatment steps and go along without not really the hustle of identifying pieces, properly labeling them because everything was already put in place. Now, our emergency response after having the collection management site basically locked down and being organized is the establishment of a workflow. And this structure, which I call clean rooms, is very helpful. So it's basically polyethylene sheeting that is uh, very thick and it basically lines the interior of certain rooms that are suitable for treatment steps but also for storage other portions of the building are shut off with these um, zippers and so we can contain whatever mess is there having a storage infrastructure and these designated work areas is invaluable so you can see in the top left a temporary workspace a clean room that has been already populated with some of the artworks. Um, in the bottom left, what we generally speaking do is we put up an easel in a suitable area that's safe and then start with the first treatment steps, which is like the general cleanup. So vacuum cleaning and surface treatment as necessary in order to avoid contaminating and further embedding any sewed or other contaminants into the surface of works. And then you can see next to this, a temporary structure that we build in order to store things properly. And then on the right side, build, building parts that were not much affected, but are still, um, still uh, contaminated to a certain extent. So we basically cleaned these paintings and wrapped them first in zeolite infused paper in order to take care of the odor and other contaminants and then sealed them with polyethylene sheeting and taped all that to the wall. So 
I already touched up on the preventative measures on site. And of course, documentation, photography is an important part for also the insurance to be on the same page as everybody else and to inform the collector, um, the adjusters, and the artist of whatever progress has been made and to have reference material. But the best thing is, of course, to do more comprehensive treatments, as you can see here, at the lab. So whether hiring a company, as in this instance, um, elite art services, or facilitating a transport ourselves, dependent on the volume, these were 80 pieces of art. So um, it was a little easier to hire somebody and outsource this portion. Now I come to the case studies. The first one is this installation by Loris Cicini. We went back and forth, communicated for one and a half years with the artist, the owner of the artwork, the adjusters, the appraisers, and came eventually to the decision to declare it a total loss. Now, the polymer balls, literally so incoherent in nature, that they would disintegrate upon pressure. And the artist did offer to look into making a new mold and recasting every single polymer ball and redoing the entire thing, but also wasn't very keen on it and eventually discarded that idea. And since the collector wasn't very interested in moving forward with routine maintenance cycles that are rather intense for such a work, we together decided to declare it a total loss. Another interesting example is this one here. It is basically polystyrene balls atop a white metal structure. Now, this is the one that was taken by the first responders and thrown into the middle of the room. And it's rather tricky to clean polystyrene balls like that. And they're really just flopped onto the surface. Um, there is some adhesion, but little. And so we contacted the artist and decided to basically redo the entire sculpture. Now this was high time pandemics and for the artist to come to LA wasn't really an option. The sculpture could have traveled, but transportation was tricky at that time too. And so the artist basically authorized us to redo the polystyrene balls uh, part. So we stripped the entire thing down to this white paint that's atop the metal and repopulated the entire surface with little polystyrene balls. Um, using polyvinyl acetate. Another, another case is this lettering by Lawrence Weiner. Now, we first had to protect it, as you can see in the top left picture, and then decided on a course of action. Now, this was rather predictable because the parameters for the lettering were all there. So the owner, but also the artist have these information. And we just decided to, to then remove it because the entire house needed to be repainted to match all the sides after the impact and then to redo it. So Lawrence Weiner likes to work, or when he was alive, he liked to work with a particular sign painter and he actually executed this one before and we rehired him to execute this. A very interesting occurrence was that at the same time a Singapore museum requested this artwork for a loan and the digital file with all the parameters was basically sent to them and it was simultaneously displayed in Singapore as it is on my client's facade. So this is a little glimpse into how we handle
comprehensive insurance claims. It has, of course, many more components to it because there were over 80 artworks that we actually actively took care of and um, all in very different manners. But oftentimes when it is a little bit more complex in conjunction with the artist's opinion, of course, which is very valuable in order to determine treatment directions and also to determine losses. And then all the different other stakeholders, of course, have other interests. And we as the conservators, we, in these instances, work as a mediator and a liaison in order to not only represent the best interest of the artwork and its preservation, but also to basically make everybody understand and be on the same page. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Camila, and thank you to all of our speakers and attendees. Due to technical issues, we are not able to offer a discussion portion to this webinar, but I encourage you to reach out to our speakers if you have any questions. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I hope to see you at another emergency committee event soon.